but the question is if he starts with k and then he might get critical mass on k equal to yeah. and that could have an overall negative effect on k. Exactly all the time. Yeah. And that's a more insidious problem. Okay. Do you think it's just? You don't know? It's also, you know, I think there's also a huge difference in how they can language approach it. Because for example, the interest in the app, there's a far more spam and far more like commercial risk. For example, in the case of the interest, especially the geo part of the project, it's not possible there. Well, we're in the Thank you. 
Uh, what if you don't do mirroring? I mean, what if you do mirroring? I think that might be what So you can see some very famous 
uh, cases from the past, including number one, uh, which some of you might know about if you look back in the history of when Jimmy edited his own page and even admitted later on, yeah, I probably shouldn't have done that. Um, you've seen cases like um, the recent case of WikiPR, but in between we've had a lot of interesting things that have informed uh, Wikipedia's stance towards paid editing. So we're going to take a look at some of these and then talk about what has developed in this past year that has really been a breakthrough on Wikipedia. So um, Wikipedia COI, if you've ever looked at the conflict of interest statements on Wikipedia, it's uh, fairly uh, extensive now, but William found something quite interesting about this. As I said, we'll find the very first version of this uh, guideline because as Andrew says, it's very well developed now, but like every Wikipedia page, it had a, you know, an early version that was not as well developed, a lot more ad hoc. And so here is what the page was in the very first place. It was actually called Vanity Page at that point, but it was uh, then moved over to Conflict of Interest. Uh, funny enough, the, uh, the, the, the guideline was created by an editor that was later banned for sock puppetry. And for those of you who've been around Wikipedia for a long time, the editor who uh, banned that other editor was the infamous SJ. Not the SJ that we still like and is around, but uh, the other one, the one who was in the New Yorker. E-S-S-J-A-Y right. so e -S 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 was, ironically, the guy who blocked him, right? So not long before he exited with the media so. <laughs> Right. So this is the WPCOI, the first version. Um, but I want to put this diagram up, because I think it helps explain why this is actually quite a bit more complicated than saying, if you're paid, don't edit. If you're unpaid, you're free to edit. And the reason why I like this is because it actually divides the issue into different uh, different parameters. One is, are you paid or are you unpaid? And the other axis here is, are you conflicted or are you unconflicted? Because you'll realize that we actually have four quadrants here that, that can actually classify different types of editors, right? We can actually have, in the upper left-hand corner, a paid editor, and we're seeing more and more, as well as a whole track here at Wikimania, that we actually have folks whose 24, 40-hour week job and their vocation is to be paid to engage Wikipedia. They're paid sometimes editors, sometimes uploaders, sometimes not editors, but participants in our community. And we'd like to think they're unconflicted because if they're working for a cultural institution that's like-minded, their values align perfectly with Wikipedia's, right? Knowledge in the public interest, uh, neutrality, verifiability, and um, abiding by our guidelines, they can be very productive paid contributors of Wikipedia, not only productive, but essential for the future of Wikipedia, right? So we have. Wikipedians in residence at the National Archives of the United States, all over uh, Europe, uh, Liam Wyatt of Europe, Europeana. So lots of different ways to be paid and unconflicted. The ones that we tend not to really like in Wikipedia are the paid and conflicted folks, right? So these are your uh, stereotypical PR uh, operatives that want to erase embarrassing information in corporate articles or want to uh, try to delete something about their employer, their boss, so that it doesn't be as embarrassing in the article. Then on the lower part here, you can have unpaid and unconflicted contributors. And generally, that's you folks, right? Folks who volunteer their time, they're all your unpaid, but you believe in Wikipedia's principles, and you improve Wikipedia and Wikimedia projects because of your belief in the principles and you follow them. But then something that we all kind of know, but maybe never thought about as much, is that you can actually have unpaid, conflicted editors. Right? So these are either POV warriors, people pushing a certain point of view. Right? So some folks are passionate about a religion or a viewpoint. But the funny thing is, and I wrote an essay about this a few years ago, we actually tolerate and don't have a solution for a whole range of unpaid, conflicted editing. And my favorite example is if you look at the articles about colleges and universities, they read like brochures for those institutions, right? It's always X college is ranked number three in the mid-Atlantic states and has a famous football team, et cetera, et cetera. It's always a glowing first two paragraphs for these universities. They're systemically biased to be good. Why? Because there's thousands and thousands of alumnus or alumni of these universities and probably only a handful of people pushing back on it. So we actually have this problem of systemic bias, of unpaid, conflicted advocates in Wikipedia that we just have to tolerate. And we kind of say, well, we can kind of deal with it, but it, we know that this is a problem long term. 
Yes, quick. Are you taking comments and questions while you're going through? We're going to try to go through each section and then maybe we'll take some kind of questions I and comments. Disagree with parts of that. I'm sorry? I, I very strongly disagree with parts of that. Really. Okay, well, we can debate that. We have 90 minutes, which is great. <laughs> so, um, so here's some examples of those types of uh, editors that we have with you. So part of the problem is that one of the more famous episodes in Wikipedia's history was a just a tool that one of the folks out there who had some programming chops created called Wikiscanner. And he just said, well, what if we took all the anonymous or IP edits in Wikipedia and just tried to correlate where those IP addresses came from? And this is the beginning of a lot of interesting reporting on uh, so-called you know, IP edits because they found that there was editing happening from corporations, from both houses of Congress, from Parliament, from all kinds of places you didn't think uh, editing should be coming from. Right? So Wikiscanner, which does not really operate anymore, um, but operates in different ways and different tools, was a pretty important part of Wikipedia's history to uncover what kind of uh, IP edits were happening in Wikipedia. Um, another famous case was the Del Pondre case, where there was a British PR firm who bought the leading negative information from clients' pages in 2011. And that led directly to the public relations group here in the UK um, creating a guideline for best practices for public relations companies. And then just last year, the thing that erupted, at least in the United States, was the case of Wiki PR, a boutique so-called PR or communications firm that was caught uh, employing folks off of freelance sites and not disclosing that they were employing these folks, and even going to the point of creating fake news sites so that these folks were updating the articles to point to these news sites and say, hey, look, here's a news report that confirms what I want to put in. And even, which I thought was quite slick, going to the point of going to CNN iReport, which is their citizen journalism site, and then planning stories on CNN iReport, because then they could say, hey, it's been published on CNN, so it's valid. And then finally, just in the last few months, one of our Wikimedia DC members, who's quite savvy, just decided to Hey, what happens if I made a Twitter bot that just looked at all the edits made to Wikipedia from IP addresses in the US Congress? And that got a lot of headlines recently because suddenly you saw people updating some, some strange articles uh, from within the halls of Congress. So these are just some recent examples of how we see some of these manifest themselves in Wikipedia. And then what we wanted to do is make sure everyone knows about these two efforts that in recent years have been um, useful in engaging Wikipedians with the um, PR and the communications field. So one of them that you might know about is something called the Corporate, Represent Corporate Representatives for Ethical Wikipedia Engagement, or CREW. This is actually nothing more than a Facebook group where there are some PR professionals that have taken the time to learn Wikipedia's guidelines and try to work within Wikipedia's policies are part of that group. And then also a lot of Wikipedians like myself and Bill and maybe some folks in the audience. How many people here in the audience have engaged with crew in some way? Good, good. And I encourage you to just go to the Facebook group and, and go there. It's generally pretty friendly. We share clips and discuss issues around uh, paid editing and conflicted editing. Um, and you'll find it's a, it's a pretty congenial group in general. Um, but one of the things that we'll show later on is the fact that um, Phil Gomes, who helped start that group, created a flowchart to help some folks in the PR industry as they start to learn Wikipedia policies to navigate a lot of our intricacies of, uh, uh, of the process that we have. And then the Charter Institute for Public Relations, this is what I described before after the Bell Pottinger case. Um, this became a lot more well known that the UK uh, Trade Association for Public Relations um, came out with a pretty good guide. I believe just last month in July they updated that to 2.0 with some more details. So that's actually a nice PDF file you can download and it has things that specifically say, you know, if you are thinking of engaging Wikipedia by direct editing, that is not a best practice. And I believe the term dark arts was used in that document to say, don't do that. Right. So that's pretty refreshing for Wikipedians to see that the pro professional group is basically telling the members, don't directly edit Wikipedia, learn about other ways to um, voice your concerns in the community. So this is, as we said, Phil Gomes, one of the folks who started crew. It's imperative that the public relations industry demonstrate by cooperation and good behavior that it can work with the Wikipedia community instead of taking the quick, easy, fix-it route. Okay, so I thought this year's been really important because we not only have crew to have open a dialogue with the PR industry, 
but Bill's going to describe the meeting that we had in Washington, D.C., where I was one of about four Wikipedians who went to this meeting, and I was quite skeptical. And, you know, I teach journalism as a profession. I've taught in departments where they have a PR department. We've always had, kind of, as journalists, an uneasy relationship with public relations and public relations professionals, so I had my skeptical hat on. But I was quite pleased that almost all the folks who participated in this meeting, or maybe a dozen PR professionals, all had this attitude that they valued Wikipedia's role in the public sphere, and they wanted to respect the guidelines that Wikipedia had. Whereas without this meeting, without engaging with PR professionals, we as Wikipedians always think the worst of PR professionals or the industry, where you always see them as folks wanting to sneak in behind the scenes and alter every article that they can without us knowing it. And I think opening up the dialogue and not having the cold war anymore, but having face-to-face -face interaction makes a lot of sense. So this is an example of that crew flowchart that Phil Gomes and other folks in the crew group have tried to create. It may look quite twisty and quite complex. Believe it or not, it's only a fraction of what you really need to know to engage Wikipedia um, as you and I, as Wikipedians, know how to interact with it. So even some folks who saw this said, you guys are making things too complex. If you read this, it's actually really much simpler than what you need to understand to engage fully with Wikipedia. But it's a good start, and I appreciate the fact that Phil and other folks have tried to take a step-by-step uh, -step instruction guide uh, approach to this. So here's some examples of that, right? So the slow chart, if you're used to computer programming, is typical of what you have with diamonds and boxes here. But this is the, the big headline. If you um, are wanting to uh, challenge something on the Wikipedia page and you're a PR professional, make your case in the talk page, disclosing your COI, give your rationale, post the current text, and propose your text and sources. Um, but that's it. Don't directly edit the article. So uh, you can take a look at this chart, and it's part of that crew group where these files are uh, available. So um, if we have some quick questions, we'll take them. Otherwise, we will have time at the end to address a lot of these questions. So yes? Um, quick disclosure. I'm a friend of Greg Go ahead. Um, his point would be to this, that you're kind of driving underground, and that you do all this kind of good stuff, which look, looks great. But People would do it in other ways. And there's still an arm. Um, I don't know whether that's the point of your talk or later, but yeah, there is this problem. And I, I'm currently engaging with um, another editor. And there is strong evidence that the editor is being paid by an Indian defendant. There is strong evidence, but not conclusive evidence. And that person will use all the conflict of interest guidelines, will use all the sort of assumed good faith stuff. And it's very, very, very hard to challenge. It is also very, very hard to challenge the Wikipedia policy where harassment always trumps conflict of interest. How do you address that problem? So, uh, that's an interesting question. There certainly are hard cases, and I've definitely encountered plenty of them myself. There are times where you know, it doesn't always work very well, no question. Uh, I don't know that, you know that, that conflict of interest is seen as being worse than harassment. Um, I, you are, I'm going to be here. Sorry, so let me just clarify. Yeah, this is the time the editor has challenged the long history of this. And, uh, yeah. And we're at this place now. He said, you're harassing me. He says, oh, you're writing about it on with the idiocracy or something like that. Mm -hmm. and every little button he or she can press, he is pressing. And there is a general tendency to give the benefit of the doubt to the person who's claiming harassment. But that, that to me is the problem. Yeah, no, I, that's not a problem. I, on Wikipedia, it's always that, that the sixth pillar is the person that cares the most wins. And it sounds like the person who's on the other side of that issue is highly motivated and unethical. And I I feel for it. These things do happen. Right. Um, the woman in the back who had a question. Yes. Yeah. Um, glam, culture always unconflicted. Hmm. I would actually put them much closer to original research than fighting for their own particular institution. The issue, as I would break that, Shut down. It's not whether you're conflicted, but it's the fact that you are talking about a particular subject. If you're in the British Library, then fine. As long as you talk about library books and stuff in that library and use that as reference and uploading it, I don't think anybody would complain. If somebody from the British Library happened to be talking about a particular publisher and how their history had been, I think we would consider them conflicted. Right. It's not straightforward section. Yeah, and I think I'm in agreement with you. Of course, that's a very blunt categorization that I had up there, right? Because yeah. if you look at like Laurie Phillips, 
She's a WLAN Wiki US coordinator. She actually says, by default, you probably shouldn't edit Wikipedia directly if you're a WLAN professional, right? So certain faults can, because her partner, Dominic, does edit Wikipedia directly, and he's a WLAN professional. So even in that same family, they have different philosophies on whether WLAN professionals should or should not edit, right? Um, just to get back to your point on um, how to deal with these, these conflicts, it's my, my point. Yes, yes, you're right. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I don't know your name. There are systems in place to, to deal with it, especially if they have business. And at least the, that's so from Wikimedia South Africa, so I do a lot of editing in South Africa topics. Um, especially with South African companies, um, and companies just in general, they're pretty hampered about how they deal with stuff on like Wikipedia. And generally, it's things like there's a criticism page that pops up on their Wikipedia page, and they just delete it all, and they don't give a reason why. So there, in, in those cases, it's very easy to spot the others of vandalism, and then you just go through a, a process where you like you inform the anonymous IP address, or if they're smart enough to put a username, you like to inform them, mm -hmm. and you know, thank you for editing, and, uh, but do you made this edit, and it's incorrect, but don't worry, we have reversed it, and if you've got an infection, go here. And when they repeat themselves, then, 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 then you, you follow a, another process of the, you know, the, the order to protect the lens. And, and eventually other editors usually come along and uh, do an investigation of these guys and they're sock puppeting with their, their vandals, etc. Where, where, where it's more um, uh, insidious is when uh, you've got a, a very familiar Wikipedia editor, and, and I've never come across this, mm -hmm. yeah. it's probably because it's just uh, under the radar. Um, and they're not doing things like just getting rid of the criticisms, but they're just... Um, more subtle. They're more subtle. They're much yeah. smarter. Um, and the, and I'm sure Wikipedia is a big place, I'm sure there are people around out there yeah. um, They're just neglecting to add certain points of view. Mm -hmm. Or they, they, they dump down the criticism by replacing um, uh, certain references with other references that might overlook or play down, you know, the criticism. Yeah. Yeah. To that I would say there may also be very legitimate reasons to do that too. Absolutely. It's because the way about an open dialogue to discuss what should be the issue and or what should be the article. How should the source be developed? I mean, this is why a, a, a thread you'll see throughout this entire presentation is that it, this needs to be a conversation. It needs to be a conversation that Wikipedians feel comfortable having with representatives of companies. We want representatives of companies to feel like they can come to Wikipedia and get a fair hearing. The fellow here who's friends with Greg Coase, I, I mean, I know Coase's position is not even a fair hearing, not even going to try. I, I think that's unfortunate. I, I, I see where he's coming from. I just, just disagree with it. But let's move on to part two, where we we'll talk about what's happening more presently uh, in terms of Wikipedia and companies. Uh, I will start this by talking a bit about my own background. Uh, so I started editing Wikipedia in 2006, around the same time as I went to go work at a social media marketing firm in Washington, D.C., where I live. And this was a time where everybody was starting to focus on Twitter and Facebook, because Twitter and Facebook roll out the red carpet for marketers. Come do your marketing on our platforms, and Wikipedia is the complete opposite. Uh, but I found Wikipedia fascinating on a personal level and have continued to edit ever since then. Um, but you know, I also uh, had clients who had articles that were not very good, and these companies were expressly disinvited from contributing to those articles. But then the Wikipedia community didn't really care to work on those articles either, because they were focused on issues of actual interest to them, and for whatever reason, for-profit businesses are not those, unless those businesses are Apple or Google or either particularly famous or particularly notorious companies. Uh, so I started to put this together. Uh, back then, I you know, created an account and I started to negotiate changes with editors. At this point in time, I would make direct edits if I felt like I had consensus. You know, I read that conflict of interest guideline in the English Wikipedia that says, if you are strongly discouraged, okay, so you're not banned from doing it. You basically says, if you're going to do it, you've got to know what you're doing. I figured I know what I'm doing. Did enough of this. Uh, I wanted to keep developing it further. So in 2010, I left my job there and hung out my own shingle, as we like to say in DC, and started up my own one-man consultancy, uh, taking on clients, doing this exact thing. Uh, actually, in early 2012, uh, around the time that the Jimmy Wales announced his Brightline position, um, I ran into an incident where I got yelled at pretty hard by a couple of editors because they did not like some changes that I made to an entry. I had a client where I included some criticism, but they felt like I didn't include enough criticism. And 
So this was a long argument, but actually it ended up in the article becoming a featured article by the end of the day. So it, it worked out. And now uh, from early 2012 to the present, uh, I've always, I, I have since followed the direct line. We don't make direct edits for clients. We go to top pages and argue for a uh, few changes. Have we been successful doing this? We've been so successful doing this that my company has grown to the point where we, out of a staff of 15, where we're also doing visual design and content marketing, we have six folks who are working on client pages, talking to them about what are their goals for an entry, what goals they have are compatible with Wikipedia's goals of creating an encyclopedia. We will research material, we'll write it, and uh, either we will represent the company to Wikipedia, or we will coach someone from their communications team on how to work with volunteer editors. Um, this is what I do uh, a lot. I like talking about it, but I will move on to talk about um, more generally. The bright line, I mentioned this before. Um, the bright line is interesting. This is uh, actually, anybody, raise, please raise your hand if you've not heard of the bright line. Okay, so in 2012, Jimmy Wales, uh, after following the Bell Pottinger case that Andy talked about, uh, he was moved to make a more definitive statement on his views of how paid contributors should be viewed in the community. Jimmy's position in the past had been, don't do it, stay away, go away, we don't want you here. Problem is, uh, prohibition doesn't work. And Wikipedia was an attractive nuisance. If it's at the top of your Google search results and it gets you wrong, you know, as Jimmy Wales said at the time that he got caught editing his own page, if you see something wrong, you really want to change it. That's not in itself <coughs> wrong, that there is a protocol for getting it right. So Jimmy put together a protocol called the Bright Line. It says if you are a paid consultant, or a paid advocate is his term, then don't edit articles at all. Kind of an extreme position, never, never, even though the conflict of interest guideline in the English Wikipedia allows certain kinds of direct edits if you have a conflict. If it's a BLP issue, if you're reverting vandalism, that says it's okay. If I'm interpreting Jimmy correctly and I have not had a personal conversation with it, he's saying, I don't care. If you're paid, don't. But the flip side is, if you are paid, you should feel comfortable going to a talk page, presenting arguments for things to change, and you should get a fair hearing. Part of the problem with the bright line is that it can be difficult to get a fair hearing. Volunteers are still volunteers who put their own time on Wikipedia, have their own projects, and so it can be a bit of a challenge to get somebody to put their time and attention on your issue. These are some of the endemic issues. Um, but here's a specific quote. Uh, this is one of several quotes. This is the most concise summary. Uh, I'm opposed to allowing paid advocates to edit in article space at all but I've been extremely supportive of giving them other helpful paths to assist us. If that paid professional can contribute toward the project of building an encyclopedia, then they are welcome to do so, again, so long as they follow this, follow this protocol. I should add, this is not a policy, not a guideline, it's just it's Jimmy's opinion. But he, and even though he has, at, at most days, he's on the board, you know, no one would argue that he doesn't still have the largest bully pulpit in all of Wikipedia. People still go to his discussion page for his user account to hash out issues. You know, uh, if, if Jimmy Wales didn't exist, Wikipedia would need to create it. Um, so this is where he's the he's the most authoritative voice on this. He'll never get through past policy. He'll never get past his policy. Policies really can't be added to Wikipedia anymore. Just can't get consensus for them. But to the extent there's consensus around this, and there's not entirely, there are people who think that this goes too far. There's an even smaller minority that just wants PR people to really just stay away. Um, this operates as default policy. It's best practice, as he calls it, and I'm inclined to agree with that. So, Andrew previewed a project that I've been working on this last year, trying to bring the PR and Wikipedia communities closer together. In February, I brought together a, a roundtable group at the Diamond House Hotel in Washington, D.C. Uh, and then he says there's about four uh, Wikipedia editors, there was about eight people from the digital practices of uh, large PR firms, including person Mark Steller, Ogilvy, uh, Fleischmann and Hilliard, and Edel Edelman, and you name a big one, they were very likely there. I'm leaving out some very, very big ones. Um, yeah, I had a hunch, I had a hunch that if I brought Wikipedians together in the same room with, with PR folks, they would actually see that they had more in common than they thought. You know, I think, Wikipedians sometimes have this 
straw person idea out of PR, you know, professional, slick and trying to put one over on the public. And they certainly do exist, but I, I would submit that they are the minority. Most PR people are just trying to get their, uh, their, their clients' stories heard. And if they can put that story into the form of an encyclopedia entry, then Wikipedia is a place where they can actually get something done. So I had this conversation, and I, I brought it together because after Wikipedia, after Bill Clevenger, I'm just frustrated that the only time anybody ever talked about PR or Wikipedia, or the only time it ever made the news, was when someone got their hand caught in a proverbial cookie jar. So this was a step toward trying to get some better attention on it. This wasn't widely publicized. I talked to a lot of people, invited more people than could come. But this I wanted to have, an invitation-based, friendly discussion, and see what we could put together out of it. This is what primarily came out of it. A joint statement. Uh, I wrote a first draft, and then with all of the participants from that February meeting, we did several rounds of revisions in order to get the leadership of these agencies they represented to sign on, to say that they would essentially respect Wikipedia's rules. And uh, we released this in June. Here, is, here are the bullets from the previous slide. Uh, these identify the, the key things that these agencies agree upon. First one, to better understand you know, what Wikipedia means as a movement and as a project. Specifically, follow the policies and guidelines, especially the ones surrounding conflict of interest. The terms of use, which you know, uh, folks are probably aware that uh, the Wikimedia Foundation very recently updated the terms of use to make it absolutely required to disclose your paid interest. Um, we released this a week before that. I, I knew that I was in conversation, but I did not know that that was going to be coming out a week later. So when people ask me, how does that affect this? I was like, no, we, uh, uh, this is future-proofed against that. We are already following that, that rule. Um, you know, uh, when, look, this statement does not mean that people at these companies are never going to do the bad thing again. Bad things will happen. Individual people will make edits that their superiors, uh, you know, either didn't know they shouldn't ask for or didn't know about. And when it happens, when it's caught, this should be dealt with in the same manner that one would deal with any violation of a, a company ethics guideline. These PR companies a lot of, put a lot of effort into their ethics policies. They also don't always follow them. It's just it's the nature of the beast, and it's unfortunate, but it's, it's the real world. But where they can catch them, where we can, and here's where you as Wikipedians could be, I'm sure you were already watching for a funny business, but know that if a company has signed on to this group and you can identify the, that a company from this, from this statement is behind an edit, like, you should make, put that together, like, let them know that, uh, because they, they, they've already said they wouldn't. Um, and of course, lastly, to publicize our views, we want to get this out there, hence this panel, for one thing. So when we announced it in uh, June of 2010, by the end of the day, that first day, we had 11 agencies signed to it. So again, Ogilvy, Fleischmann, Burson Marsteller, Ketchum, Porter Valley, Edelman, uh, these are some of the largest firms in the world. Edelman, by itself, is far and away the biggest, uh, well, standalone agency. For those of you who don't know a lot about PR, there are these two large British firms that own almost every single other PR firm in the world. So like Ogilvy and Burson Marsteller are both, both owned by Omnicom. Uh, no, not Omnicom, um, WPP here in the UK. And then several of these others are owned by Omnicom. Then there's a French one called Publicis that owns even more. Edelman's the only one that is uh, standalone, not owned by anybody else. But all, these are all pretty big, except for my company, which is much, 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 much smaller. <laughs> um, by, by the time we're having this conversation here, we now have 35 uh, companies signed on to it. Uh, we added, uh, so Helen Bolton is another WPP company. Uh, they were part of the original uh, group discussion and it took them a little bit longer to get their approval. Uh, I'm glad that they like, really ran the traps. They really like, took it all the way to the top and made sure that their executives understood what it meant. Um, we definitely had to make changes to the, you know, to the statement in order to get everybody agreed to it. It was, it was an interesting, interesting way to balance different views. But once it was released, it is set, and we ideally want every public relations firm that is capable of following these rules to join it. So we're inviting anybody to join. We also advise 
Make sure that you have the agreement of the top brass of the company. Make sure that you are starting to put together you know, methods of enforcement and methods of communicating this to your team members, whether you are a company of 10 people or 10,000 people. Um, obviously more of a challenge than 10,000 people. And that's essentially, that's a, especially where you will see companies trip up. So it, when we released this, uh, a couple of days later, I got a call from a reporter who told me that they had heard that someone from one of the companies on this list had made an edit that they you know, clearly shouldn't have made. And to that I said, you know, I knew this was going to happen. I just didn't know it would happen this fast. And yeah, it's going to keep happening. But this is at least, here's a sign pointing in the right direction. Um, you know, the reaction from the, oh, the, the reaction from, I mean, we have a lot of press for this, that's for certain. Uh, we also even got um, MSO Group, which is one of the uh, agencies signed to it, based in France. Uh, here's a memo that they circulated internally at the company, and internally, globally. I mean, this one's in English, I assume there were other language versions, saying, so there's the bullet points, these are the things you need to agree to. Then down at the bottom, they have some additional advice on how to uh, follow it. So if you are currently editing a page, here's what you should do. Go to the top page, disclose your interest, that sort of thing. Um, I've been very, very happy with the uh, response to it. Um, like I said, we got a ton of coverage from Wall Street Journal to uh, PR Week, uh, on this side of the pond as well. Uh, CIPR, which released the, um, the, the great best practices guide a couple of years ago, also signed on to it in a um, kind of an edited by advisory capacity. Um, just very, very happy about it. They've been great to work with on this. Um, and it's that. By the way, one last thing about this before I turn it over to Christophe. Um, this is not the end of the project. This was the beginning of the project. This was a first statement from the agencies to the Wikipedia community saying, we haven't always got this right, but we are learning. We want to learn more. We want to get it right. So if you are open to a dialogue with us, then we are definitely open to a dialogue with you. So I'll have more about where I'm taking it next in a little bit, but next, Christoph's going to talk about uh, some of the work that he's done on the French Wikipedia. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> well, um, I'm Christophe Henner, I'm Vice Chair from Bien France. I also used to be a consultant for an but and marketing agency, and now I'm head of marketing for media. So I actually have been on the two sides of the fence, being a Wikipedia for nine years now, I think, and being a company that is actually making marketing communication. Um, I started making talks in Wikipedia about companies and editing in 2010, I think. And last year I had two tracks like that. Uh, the reason behind that is we are seeing companies are evil and that we should be interact with them, when in fact companies have been existing uh, part of the economic history of the world, and some of them have huge archives that we could use. They're not museums, but they have archives. And I'm not putting that there, but I used to work for a bank that the owner was, the family of the owner was in love with art, and in fact the, um, the office of this bank was had a curator, and it was virtually it was a museum that was being accepted by the top brass of the company. And this was sitting in the in the, in the office in Paris, on the access by perhaps 20 people, and nobody has access to it all. We can work with the company. Uh, I'm going to bring a point of which is very different from what we've seen before. I'll uh, show you that when we're talking about paid editing for a few months now, a few years, uh, the discussion is totally biased by the English media. Uh, all the discussion we have are about pay editing on the English Wikipedia. And pay editing with the culture in the US, not only the culture in the UK, but the US <coughs> culture of the relationship with companies. Um, I'm not I'm will not talk about the regulation of companies because it's a conversation we actually had yesterday. Uh, the regulation of companies regarding communication <coughs> in the US, which is virtually non existent, which is not the same in Europe. So the relationship to companies and PR and communication and company communication is very different than you are in Europe and the US. And this is really important. Uh, the first thing is, uh, a few years ago, well, for IFA, I made a study of the top 40 companies in France and just look at the quality of those articles to see 
not even if they were good, but they went above the, the, the state, uh, the step of the biggest step. And all the 40 articles, I mean, you can see, it was a, a grade 1 to 100, 100 being like, okay, it's an article, that is good enough. And the average was under 50, because most of them were stuff. The reason behind that is, our community is not interested in editing articles about companies. We are not. It bores us, so we don't do that. Uh, I use that to just to show that if we are not, if we're not doing it, and if we don't make uh, if you don't have a framework to let company help us improve those articles, we have a whole side of knowledge and history which is not taken care of, which is the one related to the company history. Um, so I have an example of French Wikipedia, uh, or on Orange, the huge telecommunication firm, and they have taken on improving their article on French Wikipedia and the English Wikipedia. So I invite you to go on the English uh, Wikipedia of Orange and look at it and a good part of it has been written by the company. And the interesting thing is, is that uh, they published it over uh, a couple of weeks and nothing they published was reverted. Everything stayed. And uh, a few years after, it was a year, one year off, two years, I don't remember. Uh, the content they put in there is still there. It has been changed, it has been improved, it's still there. And there's an interesting thing on the French media. After two weeks of editing, an editor came to the village pump and said, Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, they are editing their whole article. We should delete everything they did. And what happened is the person in charge uh, of that in Orange came to the village pump and said, Ah, I am working for Orange. And I edited the article. And this is everything I did and all the process I followed. And if I did anything bad, if there is a lack of references, just tell them. And then something absolutely wonderful happened. The next comment. The next comment was an highly, highly ironical comment about the very first person saying, Dear Tadley. And he was saying, basically, Oh, poor of you. You came and you said openly that you were working for the company. You made the best to effort to follow the rules. You tried to be neutral. You even proved the part about criticism and so on and so on and so on. And you are being yelled at. That. Okay, forget about the guy who did everything that you should have, and this is the page you should look at if you want to keep on going. And all the other comments are basically saying, there's no problem. The whole editions that has been made, the whole edits that has been made, were following NQB and references, even improving the part of that system. And we were in the middle of a kind of a shit storm about Orange and Suicide, which was a big story in France. And everybody was like, okay, they're following the rules. Who cares who they are? They follow the rules. They are including the And this is something that is really, really different between the English Wikipedia and a lot of other Wikipedia. Uh, this is one sentence from the, that is summing up the French conflict of interest uh, policy. And basically, it's important to distinguish it with a COI, that is promotion for one fixing the mistake. Meaning that if someone has conflict of interest, it doesn't mean that he will make promotional edits. He can make good edits. And you have to look at what edits makes. I mean, the CUI doesn't mean that everything you do is going to be bad. I mean, the CUI says that, well, you have a CUI, we all have. When I'm editing the article that my great uncle that was a painter, I have a CUI. They do, but they can be great with stuff. And this part of our CUI totally allows by the policy to have companies editing their own software. <coughs> what the French community mainly will care about is, is it neutral? It is using sources and good sources. So it is, as we said, we uh, want to have a discussion about bad editing. The discussion we've been having for a few years was about bad editing on the English Wikipedia, not bad editing on Wikipedia or on the Wikipedia project. And even though the conflict of interest policy is on um, French Wikipedia is good. Actually, how we are seeing Wikipedia's project or Wikimedia projects as a project as platform are not fit for organizations. Not even just company, but for organizations as well. Most of the Wikipedia, for example, doesn't allow to have a group user name. You have a user name that's building to one person. It can be a user name for an organization. Uh, it can not be a user name for many people. And it even leads company to waste resources in order to free knowledge, free knowledge. Uh, so this is something that happens in France, Yamaha, so 
this one was about Yamaha Motors, so Motorcycle. Um, the French chair, so I, I used to consult for this company. Uh, the chair was living, it was the one that drowned Yamaha in France 60 years ago, it was living. And he said, yeah, I'm living, but I'm not living any, any vis visible trace of what we've done in France for the last 100 years. So how could I share the history of Yamaha in France? Let's put that on the wiki. But then we delve into the wiki policies, and uh, we figured out that it was not possible. So they actually spent months developing a wiki, which is under a free license, which allows anyone to edit. And I'm sure that is remaining something for Wikipedia. It's exactly the same. Same list license, same rule. Anyone can edit. But as they couldn't add a Yamaha account, uh, they will have had a hard time to make articles about some specific topics. They created a new wiki and put that in there. The wiki is still active. They are still looking to that. They are still digitizing hundreds of pictures because they have them, but they're not putting them on Wikipedia because it's too hard. It's even sometimes impossible. And by preventing, in fact, uh, companies to have a framework when they can operate on Wikipedia projects, virtually, well, eventually, we have destroyed knowledge. Because right now, the archive, paper and picture archive that are sitting and dusting in some or uh, 100 uh, years old company won't last forever. There could be a flood, there could be a fire, or they could just get rid of them. And by not having that framework, at some point we might lose that. And I think I'm... Okay. Oh, yeah. And the thing is that... And the thing we, we did have to do that because of the username policy. And again, the discussion we should have is more global because the German Wikipedia is not having that issue because they allow verified accounts. You could create an account from a group of people and have it verified through OTRS, and then you have a verified account for an organization. So I, I think it's really important for us to keep in mind that right now when we are talking about pay editing, and this work really is not a good one, uh, we are talking about, actually we are talking about pay editing on the English Wikipedia, not pay editing on Wikimedia Commons, not Wikipedia editing on French Wikipedia, German Wikipedia, and so on. And this is something to keep in mind because it can work. And we have, I, mean, I have some examples, and I know uh, in Germany they have, and in Sweden and in Swedish they have examples of companies that are actually editing, following our rules, which is all we need to carry here. And I think I'm good for the shoot. Yeah, I just said that. Huh, not listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> Should I say, yes. like, say a question or a question? Yeah, okay, so, um, well, actually, we have another case study. Let's do another case study, because after that, it's going to be mostly a discussion I did. So we have uh, Christian and Federico. Uh, they worked on a project for, uh, well, we let them talk about it, actually. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Christian from uh, Wikimedia Italy, and this is Federico from Federico Italia. We are going to... <laughs> We have uh, huge fans over there. <laughs> <laughs> and, you can clap, that's fine. <laughs> and we are to, uh, going to talk about this uh, project that involved Telecom Italia, which uh, is, to our knowledge, the first project that actually involved a company, a university, and the Wikimedia. <coughs> this is the way we have tried to bring the companies on Wikipedia in a safe way. So, quick introduction uh, who we are. Well, I was the vice president of, of the chapter. This project was uh, also um, conducted on our side by Frida, uh, which was then the president, and I'm sure you, you all know uh, her very well. And basically, this was um, a project that on our side involved very strongly the two of us, which is something I will talk also about later, but now I pass the, the microphone to Federico, which represents Telecom. I, I work for Telecom Italia. At the moment of the project, I was a member of the corporate communication team. I was in charge of corporate and social media. Uh, Telecom Italia is a leading Italian telecom operator. We are uh, also in the uh, country. Brazil uh, especially. And uh, now I'm working uh, on the uh, brand development project team, uh, on, especially on uh, uh, the brand team, uh, our mobile uh, brand. Um, 
the last uh, but also least uh, member of, the, mm, of our project team uh, was uh, with the Catholica Sacro Cuore di Milano professor Nicola Cavitadini, who is a, a chef professor of sociology, of communication, and culture, and he is in the theater. So, um, Basically, uh, what? No, <laughs> 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 <Sorry>. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, the project uh, um, was divided in uh, um, two uh, phases, and the first uh, was uh, a training phase uh, where we organized uh, a lot of our uh, uh, lessons in a uh, room and. Uh, Media Italia was involved uh, in, in uh, show, showing uh, uh, with media LGBT uh, policies uh, to students. Uh, we um, talk uh, to students uh, to students about our uh, history, the history of communication in Italy, and the history of uh, other telcos uh, in Italy. They, um, the person uh, who especially he talks about uh, these two teams uh, was uh, the, um, uh, the person uh, in charge uh, of uh, our uh, um, historical archive. And uh, we involved also our uh, president, the ghostwriter, who talked about the uh, recent history of Terra Italia. Um, uh, and then uh, well, we talked about uh, the important, uh, importance of uh, Wikipedia uh, in business uh, and we invited Green uh, Green Twist, uh, a company he joined with the TV group. Um, then uh, a, a Wikipedia administrator uh, talked about uh, his experience and uh, we have a visit uh, in our uh, um, historical archive in Turin. Then the beginning phase where the students uh, were divided into two groups, uh, where the, the Telecom Italia uh, articles in Italian, uh, maybe, and in English, uh, and then the related uh, articles uh, for their companies uh, like Stephen, uh, um, Keith, um, for us, our uh, historical company in Italy. And so, basically, uh, the idea of this project was to have, to propose to this professor from the uh, Universidad Catolica to uh, make available the possibility to uh, have a bachelor thesis around Wikipedia. And so we were able to find, we were able to find six interested students in doing this work about Wikipedia. And, uh, um, and this, you can see a picture here, and they did this work as their uh, dissorta dissertation thesis for, for the bachelor. And uh, again, there was a strong focus on the historical archive of Telecom, which is huge, uh, because if you uh, look at the history of telecommunication in Italy, there were in the past many, many companies that, they, that merged in a single company, which was uh, state-controlled, and uh, in the late 90s was privatized and become after Telecom Italia. So Telecom Italia inherited all, all the historical archives of these companies. So we are talking about uh, materials that go back to the beginning of the last century. And we wanted to assess this material. We think this material is important. And how we do that? Uh, well, we didn't find uh, uh, fancy people to, to to say this line for us. So let's say let's follow the advice of Mono, the monkey, and the idea was be very transparent and everything is going to work well. Even if it's not uh, so easy or straightforward. So how we try to avoid a neutral point of view? We tried to let everybody know what we were going to do in advance we tried to um, in, uh, involve the all other community, all the community uh, as far as we could. For example, one thing that we have uh, done, we have created this template that was saying that 
these students were uh, editing their article as a part of a project for their for their thesis. For example, we put uh, a line in that template that says, "Look, since they are editing, maybe from the university they could could be uh, editing using the same IP address because the university have uh, one single IP address when when uh, they they go on the internet." So you may find also this, uh, this thing, and these are uh, separate people, they, they are not sub-puppets. And uh, when there was updating of the article, um, they, they put a statement on the top page before starting to edit it, saying, we are going, we are, hi, I am user of whatever, and I'm going to edit uh, this, uh, this article, and uh, please uh, ask me question, Please put your comments here. And also we requested uh, two peer reviews. Uh, the peer review is also part for the feature article process. Uh, in the end, none of the articles were featured, but there were two of them that, were, that, were, uh, that went through this uh, uh, peer review process. And basically what we tried to do was this gated approach, to get the company um, uh, history and company material uh, like images, uh, photos, and so on on Wikipedia, passing through the students, passing through a university, and we, as a Wikimedia chapter, were supporting the students in what they uh, were going to do. And uh, now I pass again the word to, to Federico uh, because. It was really important for us uh, that we did this together because this is the spirit we have, we have followed in doing all this project and we also uh, wanted to show this kind of spirit here, so please let it go. Really, we are, um, the most important results for us uh, was uh, um, the enrichment, enrichment of references uh, in a Telecom Italia article. Um, where uh, um, before the project uh, we had only um, for, uh, 40 references. Now um, I think they are uh, about uh, 140, 150. Uh, we have loaded uh, uh, 20 images, uh, about 10 from our historical archive. Uh, and um, uh, then uh, we have also a mapping uh, about the Telecom Italia presence uh, in uh, Wikipedia with uh, all uh, um, historical company, uh, companies uh, uh, related to Telecom. Okay. And we learned something about, about this uh, um, whole process. Well, uh, the first thing, as I said before, we don't know, even if the project has gone well, and one thing that uh, we didn't put in the slides, all of the six students eventually <laughs> got their bachelor with, with, with honors. They, it's, it's also <laughs> because, they, yes, uh, so cum laude, and it was also because they have already <laughs> very good grades uh, before, and, uh, but the, the work was appreciated by the university, and uh, they also, had a good uh, uh, outcome from, from their, their thesis because either they were able to find a, a job or they choose to continue to, to study with a master. And, but we don't know if this is going to scale easily. As I said, this uh, uh, project uh, had a lot of involvement on our side, especially on uh, Frida and myself, and this is related to the, to the last point. Um, there was a really direct communication because there was only six students. We set up a mailing list uh, which was private to give them a safe space for any kind of question. And we don't know if it's easy to do the same thing for, say, let's say, all the companies in it. Okay? We don't know. If this model doesn't really look like it's easy to scale. And uh, one other thing that I would like to point out it's, uh, there is the need to, to explain to many people, at least in Italy, that uh, Wikipedia article is not a Facebook page. I put this actually to say that one thing we were very lucky was that on the company side, Federico and through him, all the department uh, really already knew that Wikipedia is not Facebook and it is useful. But um, basically, uh, when you 
um, talk with uh, with uh, people in in, uh, in the corporate world. They uh, they hear the word Wikipedia and they say, oh, this is social media stuff. Okay, uh, so I think this is one thing that you want to point out. And again, the last point was uh, that the interaction, you should expect that the interaction follow some more corporate side. So something more formal. Um, some, uh, for example, uh, Federico approached for with the idea, approached Frida, which was the chair of the chapter, because for companies, and this is also true for everybody who has some gun experience, that if you are just a random guy, you probably are uh, less listened to than if you say, oh look, I am part of uh, Wikimedia chapter, okay? So expect these kind of things. Uh, and uh, uh, again, that's um, basically it. Uh, this was also presented to our members, and I think it's time for question. Right? A little bit more, but then we'll get to questions. The last portion of the, the future part of it. questions. Yeah, we have huge questions. We only we have less than half an hour. Less than half an hour. Okay, so I will, I will speed through my last six minutes, by the way, which is awesome. Um, I'll speed through the last couple slides, and then I'll just come up before we'll you know, turn into discussion. Um, so we, this has been organized sort of as past, present, future. And so future, well, hasn't happened yet, and the future is not set. So I want us to discuss what that's going to look like. But a couple of things. Notice that I've put this strange phrase up there, whatever we're going to call it. This is because I think, and this gets to Andrew's early slide where he showed the X, Y axis consideration. The problem is we don't really have vocabulary that everybody agrees upon or are clear to understand. I have somebody who spends a lot of time writing about this topic, and I find myself mixing up the phrases all the time, trying to explain what they mean. Conflict of interest, paid editing, paid advocacy, there are other phrases too. Um, they're not great to agreement on what these things necessarily mean. And uh, Andrew's slide got to a part of the explanation of why that's difficult. But he has not show everything. He didn't, um, the English didn't discuss bright line too much, you know, Wiki PR, bad, because they are going anonymous. Um, but a PR firm that follows the rules is a pay advocate, but can contribute meaningfully. So terminology is difficult. And on, the, on their side, too, I mean, the difference between PR and marketing is not always clear, even to people in the industry, even if at the, at the extreme, classical traditional public relations is different from advertising or marketing, but there's a lot of uh, blurriness in between. So trying to define terms better would be nice. Here is a uh, sneak preview. I mentioned before that I had additional projects that I'm driving along with a group of folks who are involved in the Diamond House project and the public relations statement. Uh, this is going to be the publication of an e-book coming up uh, in the first week of September. Here's the, what the front page will approximately look like and what it's called. Uh, here's a table of contents along with a description of some of what's going to be in there. This is intended to build upon the work that was done by CRPR with their document from a couple of years ago, updated uh, this year. If you're going to read one thing first, read that one. Uh, that definitely sets the table, gives you an idea of how Wikipedia considers this and how you, if you are a professional, how you should consider Wikipedia. But it doesn't really give you um, the next step. So the purpose of this manual is to evaluate certain common case scenarios. What it happens, like can I just edit if I only have a small factual edit to make? Um, what about vandalism? What if an editor disagrees with me? So uh, I know some of you in this room have read it. Uh, I've been circulating it, uh, trying to get as much feedback as I can. And so while it's essentially finished, we still have a few weeks, uh, you'll hear more about it from me in uh, the start of November. So here's where we skip the questions. I was throwing some questions on here that I think kind of inform my thinking about it. I sort of had answers to some of these. You probably don't know what all these phrases mean, so if you get curious about one, you can ask. Um, Someone had a hand up here, right? And you were this man. All right, what is that? Um, question regarding the Italian Wikipedia and uh, Telecom Italia. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, from what you've explained, it sounds like it's been a very productive outcome. I've just got a couple of questions. Firstly, do, does the Italian Wikipedia have wiki projects? And if so, did you engage with them and how? And secondly, regarding the archive material, is there a policy regarding no original research? And if so, how did you overcome Potential issue. Um, uh, 
Well, I will stop you. Uh, well, I will start with the last question about the uh, story of archive. Uh, most of the material were images, like uh, really old photographs that were in a story archive. There were a lot of work which was really art about the brands, the, the possibility to have the old brands and, and uh, put them uh, on Wikimedia Commons with all the permission cleared and that's, the difficulty was uh, related to the fact that the, uh, Telecom Italia having inherited all the uh, previous brands and logos from all the other companies I already uh, which quantity, quantity of um, brands and other copyrighted or trademark uh, things and um, so uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure that I get your question about reading or research because it was not like papers or... I didn't realize it was primarily photographs. I was thinking it was old documentation which had been published in a, an independent reliable source that could be difficulty with it. It was mainly for exclusively photographs, then obviously that wouldn't apply. For, for, example, for example, for the brands, there was this uh, huge work that uh, the students have done about researching this website with uh, registrations number of the trademarks which were not so straightforward like post art to find which was the registration number for logo one two three and uh, and then link this this kind of things. And about the project yes we tried the um, students tried to engage the community through the village farm to the health desk if they have some technical question through the project. And the response was not so huge. Uh, like not everybody rushed uh, to the page, but that's what uh, normally happens on all on, on videos. Okay, thank you. So okay, we got two, two questions here with you, and then you next. So um, I've got a I've got a question very close related to the question you are, and then relates to um, written uh, rep uh, references to written sources in the Italian. Oh, Italian, this Italian example is just one case study. I think we should make sure we have questions about the bigger issue I that we're talking about. I just don't think it's fair to all the other folks who came here for the bigger issue. Okay. We drilled down on the Italian one too much. I'm going to expand it now. Because, okay. uh, so make sure it's a bigger question. There's, there's, there's another company called Marion Roberts. Mm -hmm. they, 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 someone from the company who clearly loves it, the history of it very much wrote a whole lot of stuff in it. Um, none of it was cited, but they clearly knew what they were talking about. This actually flagged the article and landed, landed up getting deleted, which I had to go back and ask to get undeleted again. Um, so if, if, you're, if you are, say, a company and you're using sources, you can't necessarily only use sources from your own website. You've got to use external sources. How do you cope with that? And you look for reliable sources, uh, you look for it. Uh, like so in the work that I do, uh, we always, one of the first things we explain to a client is that we're going to almost exclusively use journalistic sources. There may be occasions where a press release can be useful to verify a detail we can't find somewhere else. But if it's demonstrating the significance of an initiative, like if you won an award and the only press, the only press around it was the press release you put out and the press release that the awarding body put out, that award uh, was not just important enough to get mentioned. So, Part of the answer. Your question? Hi. I have to. Could you get up? Because at the back, I think it's really hard to hear the. Yeah, mm. stand up. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi. Okay, I have two questions. Uh, one for Olympia, one for Crystal. Uh, I'm totally unrelated, sorry. So. <laughs> um, well, the question to you is your presentation, the work you've been doing, and the PR firms you've worked with, primarily are corporate. Mm -hmm. It's yes. a very, very important corporate focus. Right. Is there a plan? Or is it being considered to expand this to political? So, government information ministries, think tanks, lobbyists, etc., who all come under the same issue. So that's question one. Mm -hmm. Question two to Christoph. If I understand correctly what you're saying in terms of your project on Orange, France Telegram, etc., um, you don't follow in French the same rules and very line that things have to be on top of so how do you how do you feel about that pros and cons of that? Because when I listened to William speaking, he said two things that were interesting. One was not during the speech that the sixth pillar is one who cares and most wins. 
And the other, he said, during your speech, that when you are working on talk pages, it's sometimes quite hard to engage volunteers, which frankly, you don't always care about the share of respect by the company. So those two things together suggest that if you do have a open and a paid editor can advocate for his company on the main page, you're going to have a natural imbalance, a deep natural imbalance, because you care much, much more than most, most of the volunteers. Whereas the talk page fix, in my mind, forces this kind of balance to be cemented. But I'm interested to know your views on pros and cons from the French Wikipedia side. Can I go first? OK, so that is the situation in French Wikipedia. Let me go back to what Wikipedia is. Just to remind you, perhaps you have forgot at some point, Wikipedia is a great encyclopedia that anyone can read. And when that was set up, we said, in the anyone, there might be people that want to do us harm. So we will have policies like use quality references. Those do apply to company. And those do apply to uh, the vanity or POV pressure. And we are not asking anyone to uh, say, are you um, a member of a political party? Because we want to know what our new POV is. But we are kind of saying, you're for a company, so your POV is not as is, is worse than the other. So, and we can't rely on our volunteers that are spending, I mean, Wikimedia is spending a huge amount of time uh, contributing to the job they like. And on top of that, we are saying, anyone except people from companies candidates, so you should spend more time just to onboard and help companies. Let them eat, let the people from the company do the same reason. You have to be the one you have to use references. Could you comment on the natural balance point? Well, what, the point about there being an imbalance. So because the volunteers don't really care about corporate history, for example, yeah. there is a deep imbalance where yeah. the people who care are the people who are paid. Yeah, but it's the same with plan. I mean, the people who most care about, no, but really, I mean, I saw someone who went, yeah. I'm sorry, <laughs> the, one, the one people that cares about spending weeks and months digitizing their collection is cloud. We are not doing that. We can't. We are not doing that. And if we have, uh, if the risk, uh, risk museum, I'm sorry, Sandra, I'm saying that really poorly, uh, uh, is having so much money on Wikipedia, it's not because Wikimedians are spending very a lot of time on that, but because Wikimedians spend time with the museum to do that. If the Buddhist archive did that, because at some point we help them do that. But for companies, we are saying, we don't want to help you. We make it harder and harder and harder. I think we're using the kind of other things with this last one, which is, you know, if other people do it, well, that means it's fine. I don't think that's the point. Do you agree that there is a natural imbalance in corporate articles? Maybe not only on the Like market, with the Pokemon, fires to what spam is If I hear what you're saying, you're saying, you're, saying, you're saying there's a natural imbalance in French Wikipedia because of this, and it's more balanced in English? It, it, so, no, the funny thing is, I can make the opposite argument, because what happens... Well, 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 I'm sorry, no. Oh, you're it. What I'm trying to say is, if you go to a talk page, you are creating a balance because you're forcing a volunteer to get people. No, no, no. You're no, forcing no one. You're forcing no one, right? No, no, maybe they don't, and then you can't put it on the page. But unless you achieve that, here's my argument. Achieve a balance, okay. so but here's, here's my argument for why I think the English language way of doing things actually might be providing a very unbalanced uh, dynamic, and I think you see it a lot is that what happens is the passionate folks who are editing are the ones who think that the environmental record of Exxon is the most important thing to have, and 60% of the article is the bad things that Exxon does, right? So to me, the reason why this is an important dialogue to have with these companies is that I think for too long, Wikipedians have um, neglected a lot of these articles and let them read really badly, right? That there is this streak in Wikipedians, at least English language, I should say English language Wikipedians, that American journalists get accused of is that we're quite, quite quote unquote liberal because we go out of our way to make big, powerful Fortune 500 companies look bad because they've got PR engines to counteract that if they want to. So I think there is that culture in English Wikipedia that I'd like to try to try to rebalance. And that's why I think I think the opposite of what you say. I think because you don't allow for corporations to uh, get more involved in the talk page, and we don't have a community in English language Wikipedia of taking up the charge to make corporate articles better, we have really poor articles about Fortune 500 companies in the UK. In, in so, English. I want to elaborate actually on something that Christophe said earlier. 
Uh, I think an interesting dynamic between the way things work on the English Wikipedia and the way the work is on the European languages of Wikipedia, so French, German, I think Swedish. In the US, where there's the First Amendment, companies can say just about any damn thing they want to short of fire in a crowded theater. Uh, in Europe, uh, where I'm not an expert in regulation, but I understand that you know the, the claims that companies can make in their communication advertising is much more tightly regulated, more restricted. The theory that I've kind of been working out with Andrew and Gustav a little bit over the last few weeks, and especially yesterday as we talked about this, is that I think this actually goes back to the, the First Amendment here, which you know, they, which there of course exists in the U.S. The U.S. exerts a you know very large influence on the English Wikipedia. I think that because companies can say whatever they want to, the culture has developed a greater skepticism of what is being said by companies. And so Wikipedians who have that, you know, try to act as a check, speaking truth to power, expect companies to be lying. Whereas in Europe, I think, um, Wikipedians know that those companies are being close, more closely watched, and so they, there's a great expectation that they will be honest. Man, so that's what they can do what they want to. And I better ask, answer some hands, because I see hands going up. You, sir, are in the front. Yes. And I will stand up, and I'm pretty loud. I want to bring up the point you're talking about PR people and people. Lawyers. Lawyers can get very involved, and they can involve, get involved in not articles about a particular company. They can get involved with issues about products chemicals, uh, whatever, and then if you have a court fight, you get lawyers ethically going to the top page and saying, hey, that description of that is wrong, mm -hmm. and then there's a lawyer on the other side saying, yes, it's right, change, asking everybody else to change the references change the wording of the articles, but aren't we Wikipedians that not involved in that kind of fight? Aren't we put upon to try to do something about what these guys are asking for? I think it would be the role of Wikipedia to make an informed judgment call, look at the facts, and make a ruling on that, the same way they would in any context. Yes, I've seen that okay. By the way, you had asked about political, and but I have had political clients. It's a lot less. Speaking for the U.S., um, I tend to work with campaigns. The campaigns are able to spend money that the government offices can't. And uh, working, it's usually focused on an individual. Working on articles about individuals is harder for a lot of reasons I don't have time to explain than articles about companies, partly because articles about companies are less personal. And uh, other problem with political is that campaign politics often is done in the shadows. And the work that we do is in uh, you know in the sunlight of the talk page. And so I won't take on a project where they want no fingerprints. Like no fingerprints is a pretty common phrase in um, you know like politicking. And I know a lot of people who you know they practice the dark arts as a matter of business and that does not match with Wikipedia's policies. So those people are just doing it anonymously and I don't want to do it with that. Sir can I just say in other words it's saying that your best guess is we'll never be able to control that side of it. Not entirely. The best thing you can do is provide an alternative for people. Yeah, keep, let's get more responses. Yes, yes. Let's get more. Uh, very, very short and practical question, because we are talking about the big PR companies and the big companies working on that. And that's, that's a nice thing, because you can set up policies and they will be followed within the company if it's set. That, that's a nice thing. Uh, I have it, but uh, we have to also face the thing that there are a lot of small companies and uh, small firms working that and they are doing paid editing, whatever you want or not. And that's that's visible on the on, on the network. And the question, the practical question is, because uh, I think in, in, at least in some of that's in positive Wikipedia, we, we do not allow at the moment the company accounts, uh, yeah, because it should be individual. I saw that in the German <coughs> one, uh, you have a policy of having the uh, the up approved company account. So at least if they do that, and okay, sticking to the rules is another thing, but we have on the first view that was added by the, by the company itself. And the question, the practical question is to, to all of us, is how, how do you manage in, in different uh, areas 
that kind of thing, and or, or, or are we coming to the, to the way that probably because I'm, I'm thinking we should allow this official account so at least have an overview of control what's going on. Uh, yeah. Just a word on, on that one because I know some yeah. stuff about German Wikipedia and also about uh, companies being active there. So the, the very fine, verified account approach of the German Wikipedia has indeed the, the advantage that everything companies are doing is, is public, transparent, and transparent in a technical way. So you can do uh, what you just described earlier with these uh, Twitter accounts that see what ed anonymous edits come out of the uh, Congress. You can do the same, and there is an account doing that for all edits made by verified accounts <coughs> in German Wikipedia. So you can let them edit the article on their own, and you get that attention, attention that you were asking for through talk page interaction, just through this process of verifying these accounts. So it's machine readable uh, which accounts are from corporations and which not. So I think that could would be the better solution instead of this bright line stuff that you can't really enforce and can't really follow. It's really hard to, to detect. Uh, so it will create more mess, I suppose. Yeah, I suppose. There's a hand in the back. Someone still have a question? No? Yeah. Uh, this, you, sir. Oh, uh, oh gosh. I want to see in the back. We, yes, go for it back, uh, sir. Just a two short question about the book about paid editing. Yeah. First one, is it possible to translate also to Italian? I would like you to help. I would need a translator for it. Uh, I mean, I am interested in that. So, yeah, right now it's just in English, but I think it'll be that. Okay. Here's the deal. I should have that ebook is written for the English language Wikipedia. I don't myself have expertise. This would be where, say, Christian, for example, or maybe yourself could offer. Yeah. I would love to get some advice on how to adapt it for other languages. And that's what, that was the second question. We, uh, uh, well, a user of ours you know, in, on the Italian Wikipedia made a semi-serious guide to paid editing. Mm -hmm. So if, if we can contribute with this. I would love to see that. I'm sure there's a way to do that. Cool. Right. Let's talk afterward. Okay. You had a question, right? Uh, no question. But just, just a reminder that it's not, not only companies we are talking about. Mm -hmm. Several weeks ago, a guy from worldwide.com talked to me and said they have a very bad page on the Wikipedia, outdated information, short and some criticism, and they have fear to change something. Mm -hmm because there could be more criticism, and they have a main amount of traffic coming from Wikipedia page to their page, they have peer to donors. So they, he asked me for guidelines, and hopefully this will have the outcome to help him. Yeah, the ebook should be helpful, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Just, just to add one more thing to, to that aspect, because I think among Wikipedians, there's a perception that the companies are doing aggressively stuff on, on Wikipedia, and what? cannot see is probably done in hiding. Uh, just to give you one example for the, for the opposite, I was working for a, for a pharma company a year ago uh, on an issue and they detect that the article actually says that, it, that a drug is actually uh, causing cancer because some random uh, medicine uh, person said that at some point and gets cited on that. But the correction that days later came out from the official, uh, official uh, regulator said that's no point that this is true. But the Wikipedia article still says it, and that company is just scared to death to even send an email to the OTRS system. They weren't, I, I weren't even ready to talk to them about talk page exposure because nobody could decide that within that global big pharma company. And this draft for an email to the OTRS system just pointing out there is an issue maybe someone wants to have a look at it. Here's a source citing the exact opposite of what's stated, stated in the article. And this letter was never sent because nobody within the large organization had the guts to actually do that. So at least large companies, and I think the same is true for large PR agencies, are really trying to get things right. And before they do something wrong, they do nothing. And this is something that should not be in our interest as Wikipedians because there are a lot of errors and mistakes in existing corporate art. Yeah, that, that story makes me sad because yeah. they're afraid of the wrong things. Yeah. And I get this sometimes a, a client, a potential client comes to me and asks, like, oh, so it'll be on the top page? And I'm like, look, no one ever looks at the top page. And by the way, you're doing it the right way. The, they're afraid of blowbacks by being in public. No fingerprints is what more people are familiar with, unfortunately, trying to change that culture. Can I have can I, uh, one thing? There was the sleep experience for, for our project. Basically, we didn't talk very much about uh, this project, also in the international uh, community.
community committee from two years ago, this two, last year and three years ago. We started two years ago. And basically because from the company there was a lot of fear, that, uh, a lot of let's wait, let's wait, let's wait, and let's wait a little, let's wait a little, let's wait, wait a little until the project actually finished. And uh, just to say also about the corporate style of interaction before him coming here, the project has already been presented in public at our general assembly, for example. And but again, uh, since there was this like approach before coming here and talking with William myself and Andrew about talking about we did another passage. Okay, guys, we want to present this project uh, at Wikimania and. Are you okay with that? Uh, because there, there's a lot of fear. Yes. Two quick questions. Um, uh, um, Somebody else either agrees with it or offers a different point of view. There certainly are often times where we have competing sources that have different information. And sometimes Wikipedia will choose to say, source A says this, source B says that. That's kind of the best thing you can do. Well, to, to get back to the previous point, two things. Often we believe that people in the company are different points. They're not. Uh, I used to come for a pharma company. And at some point, he asked me to talk with him about what we may do on the uh, local regulations makes that they can do anything. But when I had a in his office for me, he had the Wikimedia structure plan printed and he read that thoroughly, even for us, even more so than me. And today now he is editing on himself, not about the company, he's editing on top of his lives. Uh, and I hope <coughs> that most of us in the room are actually working for our job. So you are actually done some penalty at some point perhaps. Uh, so we don't we must not fear that the people in front of us are evil all the time. They most of them are not. They are normal people that you can talk with and you can get to. Uh, second thing is uh, many think uh, as we are talking about it and even now, uh, we're talking about companies, but the framework is not only on the companies. Uh, only you talk about and I think you talk about the React. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was sorry. Uh, talk about the we have, and we have the same with the uh, national association for rugby. They would be loved to contribute to Wikipedia, but they can because the frameworks are not adapted to them. And there are a lot of organizations that are not companies, but they are organizations that can't edit because of the framework. So, painting is not just restricted to what we have on the top of our mind, which is the big scandal we had with Wikipedia and so on. It's much, much wider than that. I think we're down to the last 30 seconds for each person, but uh, the one thing I just wanted to say is, um, as Christoph said, I was quite impressed when I was in that meeting at Donovan House that these were not just PR digital specialists who were hoping to get involved with Wikipedia and were really Facebook and Twitter experts. These folks were using, were talking like you folks are here. They were using acronyms like AFC, AFD, they knew the culture of adventure, they knew the deletion struggles that people have. It was amazing to me, it was quite eye-opening. So my, my point is that it's it's quite, we've made a pretty big leap in terms of getting these PR companies to sign on in the English Wikipedia to say, we're keeping a hands-off approach to the actual content, we're gonna stick to the talk pages, if that. There were some companies that even said, we're not gonna touch the talk pages, because we're not confident our employees know the difference between a talk page and an article page. So they don't even want to risk the embarrassment of accidentally editing the page. So the question I have for English Wikipedians at least, is now what is our responsibility now to step up to the plate to make sure that those articles are accurate? We care a lot when John Siegenthaler's article is inaccurate and his name is tarnished or an individual with BLPs, 
but for these articles that we know stick, they're not good, but we don't allow the folks who know the most and could make those articles better to touch them, do we as Wikipedians have a responsibility now, whether it's by our numbers or our policies or through other projects, <coughs> trying to make those articles better? Because I do think there's a culture in English Wikipedia of letting, it, you know, letting us stick it to the man and letting these big corporations just kind of fly in the wind and not have good content on Wikipedia. And I think that has to change, not because we should make those guys feel better, but because it's a better Wikipedia. I think, I think it's just continue to talk points. So, please do. so I have one last thing that I would conclude with, and that is simply by having this conversation, and the more, the more, the more we have more conversations, and the more we do it in public, and the more that Wikipedia makes the rules of engagement clear, which is always a challenge, of course, but the more this conversation is had, the more that companies will hear about it, and they will feel pressure to follow these rules. One of the interesting things I've noticed out of the, you know, post-releasing the statement, was I have had uh, potential clients come to me or other agencies come to me and ask me what I thought of it. Had I heard of this? When, when, when someone starts coming and asking you about a project that you led, you know that it's gone around, it's in the bloodstream. The challenge now is to keep that conversation going, and I hope this panel uh, helps contribute to that. Thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot.